thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'd, I'd like to start by thanking our colleagues at uh, Biomed Central and the University of Cape Town for, for hosting this event, which I think has, has been quite good. Um, the discussion has really been centered on uh, open access journals, in particular in the biomedical field and, and subjects such as author processing fees. Um, so I'm, my case is, is actually different. Um, in our case, it's about making the World Bank's research and knowledge products available open access. And, and we are, or I represent an institution, and I am an institutional publisher, and that's very different from being a commercial journal publisher like Elsevier, Springer, um, or others. Uh, we publish about 150 books and policy reports a year. Since we began as an open access publisher, we're also <coughs> publishing more gray literature in our open access repository. For example, our working papers and, and things called knowledge notes. And we also use social reading sites such as ESU and Scribd to get our content out. The bank does publish two journals, the World Bank Economic Review and the World Bank Research Observer. Uh, currently, I'm not the publisher of that. They're, they are published by Oxford University Press um, under contract. So I'm going to talk about open access in an institutional setting uh, and why open access is right for the, for the World Bank. Um, it's important to note that, uh, with some notable exceptions, we do not solicit manuscripts and we do not accept manuscripts from the outside. We publish the institution, we publish the research outputs of our staff. Um, and I should start by acknowledging that uh, I came to open access only two years ago, and I came at it rather reluctantly. I've been in scholarly publishing for 25 years, or more than 25 years, uh, and I believed in the commercial publishing model. Uh, as the institution's publisher, I felt that what we did, we did quite well, uh, and that we were added tremendous value. Uh, we had a sustainable business model, and it was working well. So it wasn't broken, why break it? Um, but then something called open happened at the World Bank, and I was obliged to reconsider my views. And as my boss at the time said, I drank the open access Kool-Aid. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, why open access is right uh, for the World Bank. So um, this is sort of an outline of my presentation, and I'll talk about that it wasn't always so, uh, but uh, it is right for us now because it's mission-driven, it's cutting edge, it makes us more relevant within the institution. Obviously, it makes us open and therefore more transparent or helps the institution be more transparent. It makes the institution more accountable, and we honestly believe that it makes us uh, more results driven. And from a publishing perspective, for us as the institutional publisher, um, I believe it works. So, it wasn't always so. Uh, this is from my job description uh, for when I was hired in uh, 2008. And one of the statements there at the beginning said that the bank needed to exploit the commercial potential uh, from, the, uh, from its publications. So we were a well-oiled publishing operation with a significant business publishing online databases and an aggregated portal, our e-library, uh, which we, both, we sold both on subscription uh, and also we sold our printed books and our e-books. We were successful at what we did and we had a sustainable business model. But then in April of 2010, uh, the bank launched Open Data. Uh, my immediate reaction was, tell me this isn't happening. It wasn't in the script. It wasn't why I was hired. Because by making the bank's data open, I immediately lost half of the revenues which we generated to operate the business. But open did happen, and I had to deal with it. So the World Bank's mission statement. Um, I feel I'm very privileged uh, because I work for an organization that has an awesome mission statement. Um, and it begins with, our dream is a world free of poverty. Uh, and I'll say that you know, most of my colleagues at the bank really buy into that. And if, if, if that's what motivates you to come to work every day, uh, it's a tremendous motivator. So I do feel I'm very, very privileged. Uh, in that mission statement is embedded a statement that also says that uh, our mission is to help people help themselves, among other ways, by sharing knowledge. So, so as you see, open access, and although this mission statement uh, at the time that we went open access was about 10 years old, uh, open access was embedded in the mission statement. There's nothing in the mission statement about selling books, about a commercial publishing model, about revenues, about sales. Uh, so 
how did open access come to the bank? Um, it really began uh, under the leadership of the former president, Bob Zellick, and he gave a speech at Georgetown University in September 2010 where he talked about um, democratizing development and a new way of doing development. And there's a quote here from that speech where he says, the aim is to open the treasure chest of the World Bank's data and knowledge to every village healthcare worker, every researcher, to everyone. Now, I don't believe that we reach every village healthcare worker, but uh, we're not putting any impediment to do so. Uh, obviously, there are some of the technology issues that were discussed yesterday uh, play into that. So, what is the treasure chest of the World Bank's knowledge? I like to say it goes from early childhood education to old age security and pension reform, from climate change to the investment climate, from fragile states to health, and from gender equality to climate change. So it covers uh, quite a spectrum of knowledge, and that is what I call the treasure chest of rollback knowledge. So the World Bank, uh, I mentioned, uh, had an open agenda. So what is it? Uh, as an institution, we want to be open about what we know, and we do that by sharing our data and our knowledge. We want to open, be open about what we do, about our operations and about our results, how our, how our resources are spent. We want to be open about how we work, and we do that through partnerships with or other organizations to leverage what we do with their skills and, and their resources. And we also promote open government among our member states because we believe that that leads to transparency and accountability and ultimately to better development results. So there are four pillars to the bank's uh, open agenda. The first is uh, access to information. Um, and this, uh, our access to information policy, which was implemented in July 2010, is modeled after the US and the Indian access to information or sunshine laws. Uh, and it really changed the bank's emphasis on, on information. This replaced what we call a disclosure policy. And the disclosure policy said everything is confidential except this list of documents which, are, which we will make freely available. Uh, and it turned that into saying everything is available except a small list of documents which shall remain confidential. And these exceptions include personal information, information subject to attorney-client privilege, security and safety information, information provided to member countries or third parties uh, in confidence. So this access to information policy is an example of how we're open about, about what we do. And when this was launched uh, two years ago, Chad Dobson at the Bank Information Center, who, who is often a critic of the bank, uh, said that the bank's access to information policy is a gold standard for financial institutions. This is, a, just very briefly, this is the, the World Bank's access to information website. I circled the fact that uh, it's not that the information there is necessarily available in seven languages, but uh, the portal, the, the ability to access information to help you find it is there in seven languages. Uh, and this is an iPad app which my program developed uh, to uh, make it easier for people walking around with an iPad and having good Wi-Fi connection to access our, uh, our information. Um, the second pillar of our open agenda is open data, and this again is an example of uh, being open about what we know by making our data available and about what we do by making the results of our operations available. So this is the open data portal. I'd just like to highlight that, um, that we released uh, over 8,000 time series uh, of socioeconomic indicators and over 850 additional data sets. Uh, to me, this was a tremendous blow when it happened because this is what took the bottom out of my business model because uh, that's where we made uh, most of our revenue. Uh, this is uh, the uh, Mapping for Results portal. It's an example of how we're using open data to make our, our uh, information uh, to, to help empower citizens to, to help us uh, be more focused on what we do. And what it does, it visualizes the location of bank finance projects so that others can monitor uh, the development impact of our work. And these three lines here show you the access to our data, the unique visitors, the total visits, and the pages viewed in the last three years, uh, the year before the open access, the open data, the first year of open data, and then the subsequent year. And as you can see, 
access to the data has grown tremendously. So if access to information and open data are the first and second pillars of the bank's open agenda, the open access policy and creative common licensing are the third and the fourth. And these are examples of our being open about what we know and about what we do. So, uh, but as I said, uh, I came to this a bit reluctantly at, at the time. Uh, and we, we had what we called, I called the conflict between mission and money. And that stemmed from the fact that we were um, driven politically, which basically meant make the content available on the internet. I know you're selling the books, but make the PDFs freely available. But we were judged financially. We had to deliver results, and we had to cover the the um, we, we had to cover the cost of the program. As far as I concerned, uh, we were doing at the time before we went to open access. We were doing everything right. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia were the second and third largest markets for our books in terms of number of copies sold. Not in terms of revenue, because we had very steep discounts, but in terms of number of copies sold. They exceeded the total number of copies we sold in Europe, for example. And I don't think there's another publisher in the world who could, who could make that statement. Um, our revenues were growing, and that was important. That came mostly from the data, the online databases, and the e-library, although books still represented 50% of our, of our revenues. Um, and that was important because it was helping to fill a gap. Our budget from the institution declined every year, in part because we were able to make up for it from revenues. Uh, so that was important. We had, for many years before we became open access, making our books available on the corporate website, on Google Books, on Scribd, on ESU. Uh, we launched the first World Bank Facebook page and the first Twitter page. And this was really following a tradition uh, at World Bank Publications because we also launched the first corporate website, the first e-commerce site, the first aggregated portal. We published the first e-books and, as I mentioned, uh, the first app and, and the first Facebook page. Um, so, nevertheless, uh, things were happening. Uh, we noticed that uh, because we were making so much content available online, uh, that the sale, and the, not just the sale, the total dissemination of our books were dropping dramatically, as is highlighted in this graph. At the same time, our followers on social media, we had, you know, we had changed the program, the way we promoted our program, the way we accessed and reached out to our customers uh, through Twitter, through Facebook, through Google Books, through Script, through ESU. And uh, that was growing tremendously to where now we have close to 90,000 followers of one sort or another uh, in, in social media. And then at the same time, the dissemination of our, print, of our books online was growing uh, <coughs> tremendously. Uh, and this is, uh, with respect to electronic, it's only that which we can count, and there's a lot that we can't count because people can download our PDF and redistribute it and we don't know about it. So, uh, but nevertheless, it's a tremendous ratio from 180,000 books last year, last fiscal year, which ended in June, disseminated in print, to over 6.2 million that we can count uh, uh, disseminated uh, electronically. So clearly something was happening and something had changed. Um, and please bear in mind that this figure here, this growth in electronic, is by and large before we adopted open access. So we were distributing the same content, but through different channels, and clearly, clearly the growth that was there. So uh, in uh, two years ago, or almost two years ago now, we commissioned the strategic review of our World Bank publications. And the objective of that review was to create a cutting-edge publishing model that fully embraced full and open access and with a particular emphasis on electronic dissemination. So we hired a company called Key Perspectives, uh, Alma Swan, uh, who's with, um, with Spark, uh, and her colleague did the study for us. And they came up with three core recommendations. One was to adopt an open access policy. The second one was to adopt Creative Commons licensing, which we did. We've adopted the Creative Commons by license for that content which we ourselves published. I should state that, we, that our researchers published in peer-reviewed commercial journals, and uh, according to our, access, to our uh, open access policy, the author-accepted manuscript must be made available in our repository 
immediately accessible to our staff uh, and accessible to the outside world after the embargo. So in that case, we are following a green open access model, not a gold open access model, with respect to the content, that, uh, the research articles that are published externally. And the third recommendation was that we uh, implement an open access repository, which in our case we call the Open Knowledge Repository. And when you take all that together, uh, which we did, we implemented the three recommendations and uh, we're now an open access, access publisher. Um, I'm thinking yesterday to, I think it was Laura's comments about uh, implementing a policy in an organization and she had that diagram where you can be uh, less bureaucratic, more bureaucratic, and you can have lesser control or title control. Well, we're a very bureaucratic, tightly controlled organization, so it was a bit of a challenge to, to get that done. Uh, we were able to do it because really the push was coming from the top of the organization, from the president and the managing directors down, who were saying, get, get it done. And that, that made it very helpful and, and a lot easier for us to be able to do that. So this is just some statistics, uh, and there are a few slides here which I'll go through quickly, um, from our open knowledge repository, our open access repository. This is showing the weekly downloads, um, and it's an average of 8,600 uh, 8, documents downloaded. Uh, it's a good growth curve, and there's a spike in October. Uh, October is the, the month of our annual meeting, so I'm not sure whether that contributed to it, but the good thing is that it's across all of our collections, not across any <coughs> single collection. Um, I'm, this here shows uh, the monthly downloads. Uh, it's up to 80,000 now. Uh, the, the good thing is that about 42% of these come from developing countries, so um, not, not too bad. Uh, and again, the total download uh, and the growth there. It's 258,000 downloads in about six months since we launched it. It's small compared to the 6.2 million accesses to our books electronically last fiscal year. The question I have, and I don't have the answer to that yet, are we reaching a new audience or are we cannibalizing audiences that were reaching us through, through other channels? And obviously my hope is that we're reaching new audiences because this content is licensed under CC BY, we also hope that it's making, uh, having impact elsewhere also. So this shows you the top 30 countries by downloads to our open access repository. There are four that are in Sub-Saharan Africa, and there are 12 that are in other developing countries. So f more than 50%, 16 <coughs> out of 30 of the top countries that are, are users from countries that are coming to our repository are from developing countries, and that's a good trend. We hope that will continue. Uh, and this is just uh, very briefly a timeline of how we've added content. We've gone from 3,000 documents in April of this year to 10,000 documents uh, this month. Uh, and this is just a very briefly a timeline. Uh, the light purple uh, shows when we've added major content collections to the repository. In July, we uh, implemented the open access policy. So we actually launched the repository and made that content available under CC BY before the uh, policy was formally adopted on July 1st, which is the first day of our fiscal year. And then in the dark gray, you see that we, we still have an ongoing development uh, process for, for the repository. So sustainable open access mission-driven publishing. Uh, in an institutional setting. Uh, what does it take, since we're talking about sustainability? Uh, in, in our case, it takes lots of good content, and, and I'm very fortunate to work for an organization uh, that has a lot of good content. Uh, we've built an ecosystem for World Bank research and knowledge that integrates seamlessly from the generation of the content to reaching our readers all over the world who access our research and knowledge in multiple formats and through a myriad of channels. And we do this for customers that range from senior policymakers in capitals around the world to development practitioners in remote villages. Uh, and to make this possible, we need to work with partners around the world. And these partners range from distributors, and this is true, that go into remote villages with a bookmobile to distribute our books to working with Google, Amazon, and Apple. We need a strong brand. And I'm fortunate to work for an organization that has a strong brand. Uh, as Eve mentioned, it wasn't always a positive brand, uh, but uh, I think we have a, a more 
a better brand now? Um, you need an enabling, authorizing environment which makes it possible for us to implement an open access policy, to implement the Creative Commons licensing. And I'll say a little bit about that, that um, there's a group of international organizations that have gotten together, led by WIPO, OECD, and uh, we're part of that working group that is looking to port the CC license into one for the inter intergovernmental organizations to take into account some of the specific legal issues they had. And I was confronted with the, with the decision of, do we wait for that process to end uh, before we implement our open access policy with the CC licensing, or do we go ahead and do it? And to the chagrin of some of my colleagues, we made the, the latter decision. We went ahead and we implemented the CC unported license, uh, which meant that we had to clear that through our legal department because it wasn't always possible. We also, uh, just uh, last month in October, in our publications committee, we, having already adopted the, the open access policy, we also took to them and they have endorsed uh, a new publishing policy for the institution, which institutionalizes the, the business model and the way we operate within the organization, given that we're now working in an open access environment. Um, we have to be... Uh, Client oriented. And when I talk about clients, for me, it is the author departments uh, around the institution. Uh, we can't dictate to them. We can't take six months to publish a book. We can't tell them how they do it. What we have done is we structured our editorial program around different categories of content, and we're setting up digital workflows to, to enable us to publish quickly at lower cost uh, and for that content to be born digital. And we have to be competitive. And when I say competitive, it means that we do not have a requirement in the institution that they have to publish through our program. Uh, an author can take a manuscript and publish it externally. We do, we do now require that it be made available open access according to the terms of our policy, but they don't have to work with us. So we have to be competitive with respect to the market, although that doesn't mean that we have to be the lowest cost option. because. What we do is, uh, you know, as I tell my boss, it doesn't happen by accident. To be a cutting edge open access publisher and to continue to push OA boundaries, we need to attract and retain the best talent and we need to develop and deploy the best technology and that takes resources. And the, the way we do it basically is by providing our clients the best possible service with respect to how we work with them to get the manuscript published and provide the best possible outcome with respect to making that content available to all relevant channels in all relevant media, uh, and we do that quite well. We also have to focus on, on our customers. And that basically, it means, it means a number of things, but for one example it is, although we are an open access publisher, it doesn't mean that the only way to get our content is to come to our open access repository. Uh, if what's most useful to you is a printed book, we will supply a printed book, although we mostly do that through print on demand now. If what's most convenient to you is to buy it for a Kindle, then that book has to be available on the Kindle and it will have a charge. So basically, the content itself is free and it's freely available on our repository, on Google Books, on Scribd, and through other mechanisms. Uh, but if that's not what's most convenient to you, we make it available to you. Uh, through channels where you might pay. We have to be innovative uh, because our clients require that we be innovative and our customers require that we be innovators. We need to be entrepreneurial uh, in order to uh, be able to ensure that we have the resources that we need to continue to be a cutting edge open access publisher and to push the OA boundaries. We need really good people uh, and I'm fortunate to have a, a very, very talented team and that's costly. It's not. Uh, it's not cheap and it doesn't happen by accident. Uh, and it doesn't hurt to have a little bit of luck. Uh, and I found that, generally speaking in life, the more luck you have, the better things are. So, if the currency of open access is not a currency, it's not money, it's not sales and not resources, what is it? In our context, it's development impact. And uh, so, I'd like to show you here, this is the cover of our annual report. It was published uh, just last month, and let me just say I had a lot to do with this cover, but we, we did an infographic for the cover, which is looking at some of the results that have been achieved
through uh, the, including the assistance of the World Bank. These are not the World Bank's results. These are the results of our member countries that we work with, uh, but it's pretty remarkable. And so if, and I'm not suggesting that because we're an open access publisher uh, that we in any way influence those results. I like to think that, that we do. But what I'd like to say is that if, if, by making, if by being open access, by making our content available to anyone where the only barrier to access is having the technology to get on the internet, and I know that's an issue in many parts of the developing world, but if we remove all of those barriers and we also remove the barriers to the use and reuse, if that any way contributes to these results, then that makes our having been an open access, uh, moving to open access uh, quite successful in my mind. So, next steps for us, uh, first of all, it is to network with and to learn from the open access community, one of the reasons I'm here. Um, we'd like to partner with other institutions uh, in order to make our repository interoperable with their repositories. And it's not just about, or it's not even mostly about making our content more discoverable because it's interoperable with other repositories. In fact, it's just the opposite. We hope that this will help promote south-south knowledge exchanges and south-north knowledge exchanges. So um, if, if, uh, if you have an institution, if you're in Africa or elsewhere in the developing world and you think it would be useful to you to have your repository interoperable with ours because of the reach that we have, because of the brand that we have, please let me know, please contact me. We'd love to get in touch with you and make that happen. Um, I'd like to see how we take that treasure chest of World Bank knowledge that we discussed earlier and see if we can develop open educational resources. Uh, I'm not sure how to go about that. I've started a number of conversations and I will continue to do that. But basically, we have 10,000 documents in that repository. Take any of the subjects that I showed when I did that little chart with the treasure chest uh, and we're going to have research articles, we're going to have policy reports, we're going to have working papers, we're going to have a lot of knowledge there. And how can we package that in a way that it uh, can be used in an educational setting? We will take care of putting it in the appropriate format, we will take care of promoting it, we'll make sure it's freely available and it's free to use and reuse. So if you have any ideas there and can help me move that along, I'd appreciate that also. Uh, to the extent that we can, uh, I'd like to be an advocate for open access. I think that uh, originally and most importantly, it's with uh, the other institutions uh, like the World Bank, the IMF, the OECD, WHO, ILO, the ones that haven't fully embraced open access. We'd like to advocate for open access. And we want to do it in a way that doesn't mean that they say, well, we put the PDF on our website, we're now open access end of story. Uh, we want to make sure that they adopt open access in, in the true sense, and if we can help promote that, we will do that. And where we can, uh, if we can add value, we'd like to help in building open access capacity. Uh, uh, and we would have to do that selectively, of course, because of resource constraints, but if we can add value, I will make sure that we, we set aside those resources to try to make that happen. Um, so, uh, in summary then, uh, for the World Bank, uh, open access is mission driven. Uh, it is cutting edge. I mentioned that we need to work from, from uh, basically distributors that drive a bookmobile into remote villages to organizations that include Google, Apple, and Amazon. And we do span that whole gamut and we are really at the cutting edge. It has made us very much more relevant than we used to be within the organization. Obviously it makes us more open, more accountable, more results driven, and it works. And if you'll indulge me for a minute, uh, I'd just like to add one little thing here, which is a little video clip that we did. 